Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A real pleasure to speak to you today. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, really well. Good. Keep off. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly one. Oh, um, yeah, just want kisses. <laughs> Um, so maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to this incredible documentary, um, which I absolutely love watching, In the Middle. Um, what can audiences expect when they watch it? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Have you not? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, no, I've not seen it. Um, but I've, everyone that's seen it says it's really, really good. Um, I think it's... Uh, it's um, documentary and documenting uh, myself and a few other referee colleagues, um, both on the football pitch and uh, off the football pitch. You know, some stuff that we get on with in our in our day to day lives. I think there was I don't know if they showed it. I think they come around once when I was jump starting my car. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my god! <laughs> um, yeah. So sadly for me, I don't. They, I don't think I look glamorous in any of the any of the videos. I think I'm dog walking in one, and um, but yeah, uh, you know, it's just showing normal life, I kind of guess, and uh, uh, and talking about refereeing, something that we all we all love. I mean, it's funny because it made me think. I don't think I've ever actually watched a documentary about referees, or it. it we don't really hear that much about the job, the role, whether that's at grassroots or at kind of, you know, the, the top tier level. Um, so it seemed such a nice opportunity to actually shine a spotlight on this, you know, particularly the grassroots level. Um, and, and and through that, for this, you know, this incredible cross section of people. And like you say, not just their work on the pitch, but also off the pitch. So what did it mean to you to be approached and, and why did you want to be involved? Uh, well, I've, I've refereed Greg's teams for many years um, and he's always been a, a really nice guy um, and his teams have always been really respectful and I've always found, you know, after the matches, um, you'd go into the bar for the hospitality and Greg would always come and have a chat and you'd always have a chat about the game and he'd always have a good view on it. Um, Greg's a producer, uh, as you're probably aware. Um, so, yeah, so... I also appoint some referees because whilst leagues appoint for league games and cup games for friendlies, the teams generally have to sort themselves out. Um, so Greg used to contact me and ask me to sort referees out. So we kind of built up a bit of a, uh, uh, a friendship relationship football wise um, via that. So yeah, Greg said that he was doing this documentary um, and would I be interested in being involved? Um you know, he wanted me to be involved. And I was like, well, yeah, why not? I think it's, you know, it's about football. Um, anything that shows a, a good light on, on football um, and hopefully a good light and shows that transgender people can still do the things that they love. Um, I'm all for that. So, yeah, I said, come on and let's do it. And, of course, through the course of the documentary, you know, we are learning so much about each each of the subjects, including you. And, you know, and touching on some, some difficult subjects and, you know, your journey through the sport and deciding to come out in, in 2018 and then of course having health issues and so on and so forth mm -hmm. I mean did you find any of that difficult or was it actually quite a nice opportunity to kind of share that and and and, and be vulnerable in that way and share your story with other people yeah no I think um I, if it can inspire one trans person to to go and be themselves and to do something they love. I think that's positive. Uh, I mean, when my story come out, uh, I've had quite a few people contacting me saying that it's inspired them to go and from a, a school teacher to a couple of football referees here in the USA. Um, that have like said, oh, you know, I'm going to go and do it. And they are, and I'm out there now and we sort of follow each other on social media and I'm seeing them thrive uh, in being themselves. So for me, that's amazing. If, if you know, just my story coming out has, has given them a little bit of inspiration in into being who they are um, and doing something that they love because football's a fabulous game, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was... <laughs> Obviously, my story, you know, it, it, it's everyone's got their own story. Um kind of look back now and think, well, do you know what? Having heart attacks probably wasn't a bad thing, <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, because if I hadn't had the heart attacks, I probably would have made that my last season because that was the plan. Um, and I just felt che cheated out of, you know, I'm missing weeks of football in what is my last season. But it, gave, it also gave me the time to reflect um, that, you know, whilst I was in hospital, sort of that, you know, you get one life. Um, 
why should I give up something that I love that's been part of my life since I can remember, you know, I played for my first team at something like eight years old or whatever. Uh, and football, you know, saved my life because when I was younger, it allowed me to forget about everything that was going on in my head because I didn't have the internet to see. I thought I was the only person in the world. Um, so while, when you're on a football pitch or you've got a football at your feet and you're playing football or involved in any way, you kind of forget about other stuff and other bits in life. It's a great release like that. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I was quite happy to uh, to, to tell my story. Um and for you know for people to to understand how i got to that decision and i'm glad that i did really to be fair and how do you see the sport as it is today i guess from grassroots all the way up um to the top tier do you think progress has been made in terms of it being more inclusive whether that is you know in terms of race and nationality or lgbtq plus issues or do you think it's still lagging behind i mean it does feel that in terms of a sector, it, it's really lagging behind in lots of ways, um, and particularly on, on these sorts of issues. And so do you, do you still feel it's got a long way to go? And, and what do you hope to see change? Uh, so let me answer this in sort of two parts. Um, the first part, let me talk about the women's game. Uh, where I referee currently in the third level, so the Women's National League, third and fourth level. Um, hopefully I'm going to sort my thyroid issue out which is making me put on weight which if i can sort that out i can hopefully then go and pass the fitness test which i haven't taken yet by the way um and, and you know hopefully move up some levels uh, but i also referee because i appoint to referees down at lower levels in the in the women's pyramid when i haven't got gamers at the higher levels uh and the women's game is just so far ahead of of the men's game i mean um you know moving on to uh, I mean, it's been publicised, so it's out there now that I'm an Arsenal fan. Um, you know, so I went to, uh, I won't be riffing Arsenal again, um, uh, but I, I, I sort of went to, um, was invited to one of the Arsenal Women's Super League games and the reception I got was amazing and everyone was just totally and utterly brilliant. Uh, and online, it was all positive and, you know, it was very, you know, hardly any negative. On the same day, they had somebody go to the Arsenal men's game and they got nothing but abuse, um, you know, online, it was awful. Uh, so, so for me, the women's game, is, when it comes to inclusivity, the women's game is streets ahead of the men's game. Um, however, speaking as a transgender referee that I do referee men's football uh, at step five. So again, a, a, a decent level. Um, and I've even, I even did a grassroots game, like a parks game the other Sunday to help her help a friend out. I didn't have a, a, a game in the national league and I thought, oh, right, I'll go and do one, see how it is. And they were fabulous. They were for me personally they were they were great so if uh, these levels if they can accept me then they can accept pretty much anyone but the problem is is people are just so noisy and whilst we've now got a few people uh that have come out um which is amazing uh you know there's a, a lot more i mean i can tell you i can tell you of probably half a dozen trans referees now uh, there's a couple that haven't come out, but have confided to me. Um, there's, I can tell you, a dozen referees that are gay. Um, I think only one or two have come out publicly. Uh, but there's a lot, lot more that are in there. So how many footballers there are? I mean, we've got Jake Daniels, who's trailblazing uh, and leading the way. And we've got Xander. Uh, in Scotland again, so we we and and the the guy I forget his name now plays for Czech Republic. So people are starting to do it. It's twenty twenty three. Um, the 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 uh, and this is not trying to force anyone to come out, but the the response that they've got has been amazing, and it should be. The, you know the 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 uh, the women the the men's game should be really inclusive, um, and can be you know, it just needs more people to be brave and say, look, this is me. This is, you know, if it, if my private private life interests you that much, this is who I am. Uh, but I just want to play football because I love football, right? Because um, I say in a women's game, they don't have to come out because being uh, LGBT in a women's game, 
it's not a thing. It's not a thing. You know, there there are people that, that tick all their boxes and they, they're just there to play football and love the game. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I think the men's game, and especially when you look online, I mean, I've set up um, Chuck United. It's better that way yet. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I had lots of people come to me and say, oh, I wish there was a football team that I could play for. And I was like, well, there are. Uh, but oh no, I won't be accepted. So I got to the point, I've set up football teams before, I've been a player and I've been a manager. And I was like, do you know what? I'll just set one up and then nobody can say that there isn't a football team for them. Uh, I set Truck United up 18 months ago. We played our first match. We've played matches all over the country and continue to play matches all over the country. We're in five-a-side leagues uh, that are fully inclusive and we've made so many friends. You know, we all play the game and go down to pub after and have a drink and a chat about the game. Um and we've won awards, you know, Football v Homophobia, Grassroots Team of the Year, LGBTQ Sports Team of the Year, Big Issue, Top 100, Game Changer. And we're, all we're doing is just showing that we're there to play football. You know, we um, last year on Transgender Day of Visibility, we played Dulwich Hamlet. It was the first ever trans female team. We lost 7-0. We had a great game. We thoroughly enjoyed it. There was a big crowd there. The whole atmosphere and ambience was amazing. We're doing it again this year. Um, we're not going to lose 7-0 because we've shortened the match down to 60 minutes. Good move. <laughs> um, but... Uh, We've also going to have the first ever. So that was the first trans female team in the world. Um, and again, Dulwich get a pile on because they announced the game and, you know, they've announced it the other day and people are piling on. Um, we got the first ever team of solely trans men playing on the same night, which has never been done in Europe before. Uh, so again, we're kind of groundbreaking and pushing the barriers to say, look, trans people love sport and should be able to play sport. And we're, we're getting out there uh, and showing that. And, you know, there's certain clubs and I will mention Dulwich because we've built a really good relationship with them. They don't particularly like it when I referee them sometimes because, you know, I referee and they don't like some of the decisions, but that's fine. But they're always so respectful uh, and they're leading the way, in, in my humble opinion. Um, and other clubs need to be more Dulwich. And if you look at how Dulwich are doing it, I mean, they, they even do something that's just really off the scale that no club has ever done. They announce how many dogs have turned up. I love that. When they announce the attendance and it's like, and today there were 732 and seven dogs. And I'm like, that's just, you know, even inclusive when it comes to the, our four-legged friends. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's that's my take, that clubs need to, need to be more inclusive, uh, and especially in the men's football. And did you feel that Qatar actually, in some ways, obviously, you know, a lot of people felt very strongly about that, but in a strange way, actually it did allow a dialogue to open up about this issue. You know, sometimes it feels like it's a bit taboo. Um, so... And, and you, we, people sort of realise, actually, you know, we do need to be standing up and, and, and speaking about this more and, and, and addressing, you know, issues of inclusivity. Do you, do you think, could you see that as a bit of a turning point? It could have been. And certain people could have just made such massive gestures and could have made such a difference and then they didn't take the chance, in my opinion. Um, and it's only an armband. But wear it, show. So, no, I want to wear that armband. I want to show that we're inclusive. We need to. We need to open the dialogue properly. And yeah, you know, and to not wear the armband for me, I've. I mean, World Cup in December was a bit weird. Anyway, um, and the World Cup's always been something that you look forward to. You know, I can go back to 1978 more so 1982 and I can tell you where I was on certain days and certain matches you know um yeah I mean after England beat Holland 4-1 we went over Colin McBreck and 20 of us and we had a football match after going to the pub and stuff you know <laughs> um yeah and they're just such iconic and, and it was for me uh the fact it was in December Qatar could have, uh, and, and listen, I've never been to the country. I know people that have, and they say it's not as bad as has been portrayed. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's a fabulous country. Uh, but you need to have, you know, LGBT people need to be accepted around the world. And they, uh, clubs, countries could have made a small gesture um, by, by just wearing 
the armband, which is a really, that small gesture would have just meant so much for our whole community and for them not to wear it because of uh, worrying about getting a yellow card was just a coward's way out. Because I know that if I'd have been playing, I'd have worn it and said, do you know what? Give us a yellow card because it would have got people talking more if they'd have worn it and take, taken the yellow card. And that would have really opened up the conversations um, and made football inclusive. So I think we probably took a step back rather than a step forward, in my my opinion, when we could have probably taken a giant leap forward had these countries been brave enough and said, you know, I mean, even change captains. I know it's a big thing being captain of a country, but say, OK, well, you be captain that match. You be captain the next match. So players don't get a suspension. You know, who's the who's the least likely to get booked? You know, OK, well, you can be captain for this particular game. And they, they you know, they get wiped, don't they, after the group stages anyway. So, um, yeah, they could have made made a, a massive, a massive, um, you know, uh, stance and uh, and got everyone talking positively. Instead, they decided they didn't want to take the yellow card, and they, in my opinion, took steps back instead of a giant leap forward. And of course, you know, we're talking here about the microcosm of of football in that world, but indeed, LGBTQ plus rights seem to be taking a step back sometimes more generally. I mean, um, if you think of how issues seem to play out online um, and kind of a lot of the abuse and trolling, it does feel quite regressive. I mean, how do you see kind of trans rights and kind of tolerance in the UK specifically today? And do you think that we're going backwards? And how do we stop that happening, do you think? The problem we've got is, uh, and I obviously run Trans Radio, uh, run Truck Listens, which is a, a mental health helpline. Um, so I'm very uh, active within our community. But the problem we've got is that, that there's a very few, and they are literally a handful of massive um, transphobic people that just don't want trans people to be alive, uh, basically. Um, but they're such a noisy lot. You've got... Um, a certain person that wrote a certain set of books that's got 14 million followers that just basically hates trans people and wish we didn't exist so much. So down to, we've got a certain person that's uh, the police chief for a certain police force in a certain County where I live. That's a massive transphobe. Um, and, and, you know, along with others, you know, you've got, you've got um, Posey Parker and I'll mention her name. Um, just she's a fascist Nazi and he has Nazis standing by her side. She's all about the grift, all about making money. Latest video today, she's asking for £10,000. People are paying the money because there are, it seems to be, and I'll say it, middle-aged white women are, you know, j j just go and get a hobby, go and do something instead of hating on trans people because that's there's a, there's a very small minority that are just hating on, on, on trans people and, and you go online and to be fair, the most abuse that I ever get is generally online. Mm. Um, and I'll get, I'll get abuse online. I'm a referee. I'm transgender. My skin's pretty thick. So your little words with your, you know, your cat or a dog as you, your profile picture and a fake name, it's bounce off me, you know, literally just bounce off me. Um, but unfortunately it does. And I see it because it's friends of mine. It does really affect my friend's mental health because they're reading it and they're seeing it. And the problem is some of these people have multiple accounts. So um, it's one of them lines. So it's especially Twitter. I think Twitter is, is the platform for hate. Um, although YouTube do allow people like, Posey Parker to spread her vile and her hate um, when she's doing her live feeds. Uh, but Twitter, Twitter's Twitter's the place. Now I'm quite probably more active on Twitter than most most social medias, to be fair. Um, because Twitter could be really, really good. But the problem is, it's one of them lines. That you, I think you need to. Um, it needs to be managed uh, and maintained properly in the way that they know who who is making up these accounts, stopping all these false accounts and false names. But I understand, especially from trans people's point of view, you know, I hid myself for many years. And for many years, I had my Lucy Facebook account, but I also had my dead person's Facebook account. 
uh, because I was kind of living two different lives, if you know, uh, whilst I was transitioning, you know, behind the scenes or or what have you not, or you know, we'd go away for weekends and I'm loosing and I'd have to come back and be the dead person. Um, so that's hard because I don't want to stop anyone from having that you know that social media where they can be who they actually are and especially while they're sort of going through that period um of their life but uh but yeah i mean yeah twitter's just a cesspit at times uh, and it, it's great in so many other ways but you just look at it and you, you know you can just go there and you just just see hate and hate and it just seems to be hate especially against my community which i really don't like because you know most people are just really just nice people and they just want to live their lives. So, you know, which is quite sad. Well, I think I'm out of time, sadly, but thank you so much for sharing all that with me. And I really can't wait for everyone else to see this incredible documentary. And, you know, I, I, as you said at the beginning, you know, if it inspires one person to, to, to be able to be themselves and go and like, you know, whether they want to be a player, whether they want to be a referee and, you know, and, and not be afraid to do that. that that'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, no, it would be totally amazing. And I look forward to seeing the film myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to chat to you. Thanks so much. Yeah.